Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Plot Lines. I'm your host, Connor, and today I have a priv- I have the privilege to have an all-star cast panel on to discuss the the French monarchy and the failed re- uh, restoration of 1873. Now, we're also going to be discussing a lot about sort of the background regarding the French Revolution, as well as uh, the, uh, the July Revolution and the restoration of the Bourbons. The, uh, the, well, I guess there's two restorations. But anyway, so that's what we're going to be focusing on uh, because it's kind of hard to understand the story if you don't have the background, and I don't want people to have to figure that out. Well, so uh, right below me is the great Charles Coulomb, historian, author <laughs> of the book Blessed Emperor Charles, uh, which, as he uh, informed me before, and uh, as I should remember, that this will be this is an important uh, it's an important book because there is a strong connection to uh, from Empress Sita to uh, the Count of Chambord, uh, Henry V. And so, Charles, thank you for being on this, uh, this episode. Thank you for asking, man. Uh, to the bottom right, I have Elena Maria Vidal back again so soon. So, so uh, after uh, we uh, ripped to pieces the uh, Marie Antoinette uh on pbs uh and, which was lots of fun so i'll that have that fun. link of, i'll have that link in the description but she is the author of madame royale and many other uh historical novels as well as a biography of marie antoinette and she is a wealth of information and just a lovely person to talk to so thank oh. you elena for coming on cool. Thank you, sweetheart. That is so kind of you, and it's kind of you to have me back and have me a part of this. I'm very honored. Well, I'm I'm glad we, uh, you reached out to me originally, uh, about, uh, and then it just worked out that we happened to be planning this uh, yes. uh, little uh, uh, little discussion, and it Good. was just perfect timing. So uh, perfect, God's providence in in all things. Amen. Now, last but not least is the one, the only, the great apostolic majesty, the lecturer of lecturers, the uh, the his, uh, historical um, savant of uh, YouTube. Uh, he had a great episode uh, lecture on the Count of Chambord, and as he was the unking or the uncrowned king of France. Uh, welcome back to the show, apostolic majesty. Thank you so much for having me on, Connor, and um, thank you for all those uh, very gracious accolades. Nevertheless, I feel um, amidst such a illustrious company, I do feel rather intimidated. So um, thank you anyway huh. for um, th- that wonderful comment. Well, I mean, really, you're uh, for three-hour lectures on on historical topics, I don't think there's anywhere else on YouTube that is mm. uh, worthy of going except for your channel. <laughs> oh, thank you. I don't think many people do that. Uh, even Charles doesn't do that. No. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, okay. So let's uh, let's jump into the topic. I have a slideshow for us. Uh, so now, um, Elena, I want you to, uh, to tell us why is uh, Henry, the Count of Chambord, uh, as well as known as the Duke of Bordeaux, why is he important? He is important because he was the uh, for only male heir born during the Bourbon Restoration, which lasted from 1814 to 1830, follow, following the fall of Napoleon. Louis XVIII, the brother of Louis XVI, was welcomed back from exile and restored to the throne. With him came his family. Artois, the Comte d'Artois, who was then known as Monsieur, and our, the Comte d'Artois' son, Louis Antoine, who was married to the daughter of Louis XVI, his first cousin, Marie Therese, and then the youngest son of the Comte d'Artois, who was the Duc de Berry, Charles Ferdinand. Now, the uh, Louis Antoine and Marie Therese were the Duke and Duchess of Angoulême. They had no children. 
No one really knows what the issue was with the couple. There were rumors that their marriage had never been consummated or was consummated only after many years. There were also rumors that the D Duchess had been a, um, with child in exile and that shortly after the time of the restoration, she was said to have become pregnant again, but she either had a miscarriage or was not really in said condition at all. It is also said that at one point, uh, the Duke and Duchess each took a private vow of celibacy. Anyway, there was no heir to the newly restored throne and an heir was needed. So uh, the Duke de Berry, who was the second son of the Comte d'Artois, uh, who was the black sheep of the family, and he was always in trouble. While in exile in England, he married a young lady named Amy Brown, the daughter of a Protestant minister. They had several children. After returning to France, the marriage with Amy was declared null and void. And in 1816, Berry married the lively Italian princess, Caroline of Naples. He was in his late thirties, she was 17. He had already installed Amy and her children in a house in Paris where she continued to live as his mistress. Now, Caroline of Naples was very high spirited and much more like Marie Antoinette than Marie Antoinette's own daughter, Marie Therese. Caroline was Marie Antoinette's grand niece her sister, Queen Maria Carolina's granddaughter. The author Chateaubriand always flirted with her. He called her a crazy Italian tightrope artist. She had a wonderful singing voice. She could sing and play any operatic song after hearing it only once. Caroline of Naples, known as a Duchesse de Berry from the time of her marriage to Berry in 1816, she introduced sea bathing to high society, which was considered quite scandalous. She enjoyed window shopping and they named one of the first Parisian streetcars after her. But in spite of her impetuous ways, she was very popular with the French people, who usually, as you know, did not take two foreign princesses. But they all loved uh, Caroline or Caroline. She uh, was also a generous patroness of the arts and her charitable contributions to the poor usually exceeded her annual income. Meanwhile, she lost her first two babies at birth. Then in 1819, she had a daughter, Louise d'Artois, who became the heir, um, I mean, the grandmother of Empress Zita. Now they still desperately needed an heir to the throne. So on um, Quinquagesima Sunday in 1820, February 13th at the height of carnival, the fair Barry was stabbed to death by a madman, a barrel maker named Louvel. Caroline had only just discovered that she was with child again. So he was murdered on the steps of the Paris Opera, the old opera, not the opera that's there now. In fact, the opera where Barry was killed was later torn down because people, no one wanted to go there anymore. It was considered such a terrible place after what had happened there. So then after that, they built the opera house, the Garnier Opera House that's in Paris now. So they tore down um, that opera house after this happened. But anyway, so Barry, was he was helping his wife get into the carriage. She was expecting a baby and was tired. And while he was doing that, he was attacked and murdered. But he didn't die right away. Barry, as he lay dying, he um, called upon the Holy Virgin to save France. He died in Caroline's arms in the opera box after receiving the last rites and asking forgiveness for the public scandal he had given. Caroline seemed to think that Louis XVIII's favorite de Caz, the prime minister, was behind it. And when he came to the opera, she uh, said, Assassino. You know, she was convinced he was behind it. The cause was the leader of the moderate royalists who wanted to retain the constitutional monarchy that they had under Louis XVIII, as opposed to the ultras led by Artois, who was called Monsieur. He, they wanted France to return to the ancien regime as much as possible, not completely, but they wanted a more traditional uh, government. When Barry was killed at the opera, his wife said, I have lost the only person in the world who can make me happy. She returned to the Elysee Palace, which was her Paris residence, her gown still stained with her husband's blood. 
Later at their country home of Rosny, Caroline had a special chapel devoted to her murdered husband's memory. Now that same year, 1820, on the feast of St. Michael the Archangel, September 29th, Caroline gave birth to a son who was called Henri Diodonné, Gift of God, Duke de Bordeaux, later known as the Comte de Chambord. And according to the Bourbon tradition, his mouth was moistened with wine at his birth. He was presented to the people of France on the balcony of the Tuileries in the arms of Louis XVIII, and he was immediately called the Miracle Child, L'Enfant du Miracle. Marie-Thérèse, the Duchesse d'Angoulême, loved her little nephew, and he would become, like her son, the son she never had. Now, in 1824, Louis XVIII died. Charles of Artois became Charles X. Now, you know, King Charles X had gone through a very deep religious conversion as a younger man when his mistress uh, uh, died. And as she died, she asked him to give himself completely to God. And he did. He uh, lived a very celibate life. He now never, he went to mass daily. He became a, a model Catholic except for his gambling. He never quite got over his gambling, but <laughs> And his, so, but he was a model Catholic and very devoted to the church, which had been completely unlike the way he had been in his earlier life. So, uh, Elena, Charles, Elena, can we, yeah, um, here. sorry, here. Would we, could I take a pause? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. uh, can we get Charles's, uh, oh, yeah, yes, thoughts on the importance of um, Henry's birth? Thank you for summarizing, uh, oh, sure. the uh, the the way that. Uh, Henry uh, came into this world. Charles, what uh, what is the importance in your mind? What what signifies why we should care about uh, the story of the Count of Chambord? Well, for a number of reasons. One, he represented uh, the passage of legitimate French monarchy into mm. the um, into the nineteenth uh, century, mm. and also as the last surviving member of that family began to grapple with things like the industrial revolution and so mm -hmm. on that his fathers did not, he actually wrote a great deal about the social issues uh, facing France. And had he been in a position to do something about them, one can only uh, suppose he would have done a much better job than the third Republic ended up doing. Uh. Uh, but there's, there's more. We, we've got the the larger story with the Bourbon to bear in mind um, because it had repercussions in his day down to the present. And it was simply this. If the line of the main French king should fail, the nearest in terms of legitimate birth were the Bourbons of Spain. Yes. But the problem was twofold. One, they had renounced the throne of France by the uh, Treaty of, um, oh, Lord, the, the Treaty Utrecht. that ended the war in Spanish succession. Utrecht, thank you very much. Um, so they had renounced it, but that was purely for one purpose, and that was to keep the thrones of France and Spain from being held by one individual. Mm. And that's also something to bear in mind. It wasn't an end in itself. The second mm. thing that had happened was that well, that would happen because we're still early on, uh, there would be a dynastic problem with the Bourbons of Spain. And the dynastic problem there was that Ferdinand VII of Spain uh, wanted to be succeeded by his daughter. Now, as the, the House of Bourbon had the Salic Law, but Spain, before the Bourbon had come, had not, which is why you had Queen Isabella, because women in those days could succeed. But they couldn't under this dynastic law of the House of Bourbon. So Ferdinand says, well, uh, the king of Spain will set it aside. My uh, daughter will succeed me. His brother, Don Carlos, says, no, we're Bourbon. I will be the next king. And as would be the case, as we'll see momentarily in France, <clears throat> the dynastic issue was only part of an ideological issue because the supporters of Ferdinand's daughter wanted a liberal monarchy like England, and the supporters of his brother wanted a traditional Spanish monarchy. Now, why is this relevant? Well, because the Spanish succession would become a factor if Chambord or if the line of France should die out. 
because on the other side, leaving aside the Bourbons of Spain and their descendants, Bourbon or uh, Parma and the two Sicilies, putting all them out of the way and saying they've got nothing to do with anything, that leaves the uh, where they were descended from Louis XIV's grandson, the House of Orléans. They were descended from Louis XIV's brother. Now this was a bit problematic because under the during the French Revolution, the head of the family joined the revolution, dropped his title, called himself Philippe Galité, and voted for his uh, cousin Louis XVI's execution. Now, as you mm. might imagine, this was not well received by Louis' brothers. Mm. And so there was a great deal of bitterness. Now, Charles X would actually reach out, as we say today, to Egalité's son, Louis Philippe. Very much, and, yeah. Yep. And he arranged that he should be received as a cousin, mm -hmm. as a prince of the blood royal. Mm -hmm. With what result, we're going to find out momentarily. Yeah. Uh, now, he himself, however, was married to a, uh, a Bourbon of the two Sicilies. And there, she was very much a legitimist, which, as, as yes. we'll see, would have funny results later. But so you have a problem. And the problem is that if Charles X's line should become extinct, then the heirs are either, or both, the House of Orléans or the Bourbons of Spain, themselves fragmenting in two. So this is why it was so important when Chambord was born. Yes. That he be born. Mm -hmm. it, because otherwise, it would have put the French succession into a terrible, terrible place. Yeah, I thought the I, the description uh, I think in the um, oh, I can't remember what the book is. Oh, never mind. I have it here. Uh, the Comte de Chambord, the the Third Republic's uncompromising king by Mar uh, Marvin Luther Brown, uh, where he describe he describes the the birth and uh, sort of the raising up by the king of mm -hmm. of Henry. Uh, to the crowd and it, it's interesting I, I love how the the king is the one raising the his mm -hmm. his heir basically even yes. though uh his grandfather is uh the count uh, uh is it artois uh yeah yes and he artois. he is he's not the one uh he's holding the baby at, uh, at a different point but you know really the king is the one uh presenting their future the, the future king or what's supposed to be the future king. Um, yes. AM, uh, do you have anything to add uh, regarding the uh, the importance? What do you see as the importance if uh, Charles and Elena haven't already said? Well, uh, unfortunately for me, Charles has um, already stolen all the points I would have brought up regarding the uh, significance of the succession. Uh, not so my not... fault. <laughs> 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 so I'm not quite sure what I'd be able to add um, add to this, other than to um, thank both Elena and Charles for their commentary and uh, simply buttress their points. Okay, well, thank you. Um, Thanks very so much. I wanted uh, so we got sort of the basics for w what's important or why why this is important, but I want to take us a little bit back to the French Revolution and the fall of Louis the Sixteenth. It, it, it's such a dramatic thing to uh, sort of to know that this was the history of your family. I can only imagine growing up in the shadow of the French Revolution and uh, sort of caught in between these two sort of the the two this sort of constitutional monarchy uh, side as well as the uh, ultra royalist side. And then there's the Republican side, which you know, basically um, out, you know, uh, wins out in a lot of ways, even though as we uh, will see in the future, and uh, we don't just have to worry about the Spanish bourbons or the Orleanese, but we also have to learn, mm -hmm. uh, worry about the uh, Bonapartes. Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I say something? I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, Elena, go ahead. All right. I just wanted to add that it was the violence of the revolution is why, in July of 1830, 
Charles X insisted on taking the whole family and leaving France. Now, Caroline, the, what, the, was the mother of Henri, wanted to stay. And she said, you know, I will take my son and we will go and stand before the people and I'll proclaim him king and, and um, he will be the king. Well, Madame Royale, who was the Duchess of Angoulême, said, she said, no, I've seen a revolution. They all made Caroline, they forced Caroline to leave. She didn't want to. She wanted to stay and get Henry on the throne. But the, the memory of the violence of the revolution was something that none of them wanted to face again. So oh, Henry uh, lost his chance at that point, at, uh, his first chance. His... Um... The other thing, too, to bear in mind is that Louis Philippe, the uh, son of Egalité, promised Charles X that he would act as regent for Henry. That's right. That's right. Exactly. And so, uh, as soon as they were out of the, uh, as soon as they were out of the uh, the picture, he allowed himself to be made king, mm -hmm. as he was Duke of Orléans. And the interesting thing is that. His queen uh, loyally did her duty as queen of the French, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but she never believed it. Mm -mm. And so, if you see their graves today at Dreux, uh, his his gravestone says "Roi de France," "Roi de France." Hers says "Duchesse d'Orléans." <gasps> oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and that was at her command. <laughs> wow. Did I, so well, I assume, did she die after him? Yeah, yeah. yeah she died okay. afterwards. She, she was also the aunt of Caroline. She was, she was her, her, her aunt from, they both were from Naples. And um, uh, Maria Amelie was the daughter of Maria Car Carolina, who was Marie Antoinette's favorite sister. And she had been supposed to marry the Dauphin Charles who became, uh, you know, Louis the Seventeenth, a very misfortunate uh, young little child, but he, but he was supposed to marry Marie Amélie, and she had always the knew, knew she was going to be in France, so it was very very interesting. But she was faithful. She remembered her her aunt Marie Antoinette and their family. I, I should point out that the Bourbons of Naples descend from the uh, from King Carlos the Third of Spain who did the yes. most important thing that any monarch in the history of the world ever did. He oh, founded Los Angeles. Of course. <laughs> Just thought I'd have to, have to put this all in perspective for everyone. I yes. knew that was coming, Charles. I knew that was coming. Uh, uh, you know, Los Angeles, woohoo. Uh, good job, Charles, for getting that in there. Uh, that was a, a paid message by our Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> <laughs> Were, was the was the danger real for was was it the smart decision to uh, convince Caroline not to uh, return with her son? Well, do you want to do you want to take that first, Elena, or Apostolic? Yes, uh, it was. Well, she she uh, I I don't know. I th she trusted Lu Louis Philippe at first. She called him Uncle Fifi, and she trusted Uncle Fifi. And she said, Uncle Fifi won't hurt Henri. He he won't hurt him. We'll be fine. And uh, but uh, uh, the Duchess of Angoulême said, No, you can't trust anyone in these situations where there's so much so much at stake. You can't trust anyone. We have to leave. So later, as you know, um, Caroline attempted to go back on her own. She attempted to launch a, another, another overthrow of Louis Philippe and to try to reinstate her son, uh, the, the Comte de Chambord. But it ended up being disastrous. She ended up being taken prisoner. And by that time, she had secretly married an Italian count but nobody knew about it and she was pregnant and they found her to be pregnant and they thought she was pregnant and unmarried and they made her uh, have the baby in front of the guards at the castle of Blay where Louis Philippe had her um, imprisoned. So it ended up being a very terrible situation. But in the meantime, Henri and his sister Louise were being brought up 
by uh, the Duchesse d'Angoulême, who instilled in them a hatred of the tricolor flag, the tricolor flag, the red, white, and blue flag of the revolution. And they said, never, ever give any honor to that flag. You must only um, uphold the lilies of France. Yeah. AM, do you have a um, a thought on whether or not it would have been... uh very uh, a dangerous situation to go back or did they make the right decision do you think um in terms of sort of flirting with counterfactuals i can't really say whether they made the right decision or not it certainly saved the family and it possibly could have prevented at least um some form of civil insurrection or possibly even mm-hmm. civil war in france during that time I, I think it's also important to note, and of course, this is going to be a theme which comes up as well with Henry V and the politics surrounding his possible ascension to the throne in um, 1873, how the implications of having a legitimist on the throne would perhaps stir up strife within France and cause mutinies in the army and whatever. Um, within Paris itself, um, I believe the situation was tumultuous to say the least as for the rest of the country that's as for the original french revolution um there seems to be this dichotomy between paris and the rest of france but i'd like to bring up what elena touched on which is the the hatred of the flag uh mm. the hatred of the tricolor but also something regarding the nature of uh, the monarchy of louis philippe um because as charles briefly mentioned uh, louis philippe does not accept the title of king of the king of france like the pre-1791 monarchs instead he adopts the title of king of the french and with his ascension he also adopts the tricolor flag now there was a brief time before the execution of louis the 16th where the tricolor had been the national flag Mm. of the monarchy and louis the 16th had accepted the title of king of the french and ruled as a constitutional monarch so when louis the philippe when louis philippe takes the throne he does so trying to embrace that legacy of the constitutional monarchy of the citizen king um so it's not just the fact that the trika law represents the terror it represents the um the banner under which louis the 16th was executed mm-hmm. it also represents a different form of monarchy and not just an orleanist monarchy uh, it also represents bonapartism as well um it was the banner under which french armies the grande armee went around and uh, conquered most of europe and uh, mm-hmm. and went into moscow so in terms of the the flag is not just the republic the flag represents many different forms of government but also in terms of representing as a national banner for france um the glories of the french army which are associated with napoleon have almost transcended the tricolor into something which goes beyond just revolutionary symbolism but also martial prowess as well so the flag has all of these very particular associations which are the consequence of the 20 year history between uh, 1793 and um 1814 1815 and it is during that brief time from 1815 to 1830 that the white flag is brought in as res- as representing the bourbon restoration that is the flag during which Henry V, um, the would-be Henry V, um, was born. Um, and of course, therefore, you could say the restoration of the tricolor represents a return to all of the instability and the governments which had preceded the restoration. And thereby, you can say, it has very strict political connotations, which were reinforced by his upbringing. And yeah. also, one of the things that the tricolor represented was precisely the kind of bound monarchy, you might say, that uh, Henry and the legitimists, uh, well, and the Carlists in Spain and the Miguelists in Portugal and so on, uh, all despised in England. Because remember that for them, the essence of the monarchy was a king who was, in the immortal words of Franz Josef, able to protect his people from their politicians. Yes. And my suspicion as to why Louis Philippe in the end failed was because although he came in on that plank, he attempted as time went on to play the king. And of course, that was not what the oligarchical sorts who supported him had brought him in for. 
Yeah. Exactly. The the, uh, the foxes had no use for a uh, a dog in the hen house. Mm. Yeah. We, we we reference the restoration, and you know I also have an image of the Von Day. So we have the restoration on the right side and Von Day on the left side. Did places like the Von Day get any restitution, or rest, did they get anything when the uh, the bourbons were restored? Um, because there's a lot of places where, or I've heard it said in many places that you know even when some even when a certain group is restored they don't get rid of the uh the institutions that were created by the revolution was uh, this the uh, this the situation well I, I, I'm, I, sorry. I'm sorry go ahead, no, go ahead. well go ahead. well i knew that um marie Th marie therese the Duchess of Angoulême, Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI's daughter visited the Vendée and many of those places where people had suffered terribly for the sake of the king and of the Holy Catholic faith, not in that order, you know, but they were horribly tortured, massacred. And she made a point of going to Lyon and where there had been very savage uh, massacres and she made a point of going around the Vendée and to many places all throughout France to visit the people and hear their stories. But I don't, as far as, I don't think anything was, they ever really, as far as reparations, I don't think anybody was really able to make any, or even really tried to make the reparations that were needed. Those people suffered so excruciatingly that I don't think anything could really make up for what they suffered. But I, I don't, you know, maybe Charles or or his apostolic majesty know a little more than I do. Well, um, a number of the descendants of the leaders of the Vendée, uh, the mm. Comte de Rocherette, uh, de la Rocherette, and so on, uh, they were ennobled and recognized and so on. Yes, yes. And, uh, and so the, the recognition of what they had done for uh, church and king was certainly forthcoming. It's mm -hmm. also interesting to note that when the um, uh, wars in Italy broke out in 1860 to 70, the Comte de Chambord uh, was a relentless uh, cheerleader for Pius IX. And mm. as a result, uh, at his urging, many young Frenchmen went to fight in the papal swamps. Well, a lot of these mm -hmm. came from the Vendée. And a lot mm -hmm. of the names... Yeah, a lot of the names of the Zouaves were either Vendée names or noble names in general, because for legitimist France, this was a holy crusade. Mm. And again, the Comte de Chambord uh, was a great cheerleader for this particular effort. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah, so, um, and, you know, in the picture on the right, it, it shows France as a, as a woman be, yes. being picked up, uh, lifted up by uh, Louis the 17th, the uh, 18th, sorry, 18th, yes. um, because she's in shambles from the uh, the fall of the Napoleonic Empire. Um, so was uh, they, you know, ec the economy dictates a lot of things regarding revolutions and mm -hmm. such. Uh, was really the, was the Bourbon monarchy really, in just a bad place because of the finances and because of uh, the destruction that had taken place because of the Napoleonic Empire? Well, I would say so. I mean, when, uh, when Louis XVIII became king, remember, thousands upon thousands of Frenchmen had died, not yes. just in the revolutionary conflicts, but in Napoleon's wars. Yes. Uh, the country had been bled white. And really, in a certain sense, Louis XVIII and Charles X were in the same position as Henry IV, who had, had to put Humpty Dumpty back together again after the wars yes. of religion. And that yes. had they, that was a tough job for Henry, and to a degree, Louis XIII and, and Autriche, his mother. Um, and Louis XVIII and Charles X never really got the chance to focus completely mm. on that because they didn't. no because you had the the 
uh, continuing agitation on the left, which they had to deal with. Uh, and also, in, yes. yes. They also had the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution was beginning under Charles X, and the whole economy was starting to shift, you know, and there was a big changes coming in, in and uh, it, it was, um, you know, they had the, the ra first railway was beginning, was had the, its beginnings. I think um, the Duchess of Angoulême rode on the first train in France. So there were beginning to be those huge changes in the economy that caused a lot of poverty and that on top of all the other things that had already happened. Uh, even their colonies, I mean, the, the most profitable one they'd had, they'd lost, Saint-Domingue, which became uh, Haiti. Uh, the remaining colonies in India, the West Indies, the Indian Ocean, none of them, after sugar collapsed, were profitable. Mm. Uh, and, of course, while the French Navy alongside the Royal Navy played a, uh, a great role in ending the slave trade, it didn't change the fact that the at that point the French colonies in Africa, Senegal, and places like that, had no real point in existing except to eat up money. Mm -hmm. So that would change later on, but during the Restoration, oh, and, and and let's not forget that one of the byproducts of Napoleon's chasing the Knights of Malta out of uh, Malta was that the Barbary pirates once again ran rampant. Mm -hmm which is why the Americans, the British, yeah. and then finally the French in the last year of Charles's reign found themselves forced to fight them. In the case, yes. this is what led to the initial occupation of Algiers. Mm. And that, yeah. uh, that continued under um, Louis-Philippe. Charles began it, Louis-Philippe continued it. Uh, but in the beginning, Algeria was not a moneymaker. Gotcha. Episong Majesty, do mm. you have anything to add on that? No, just to emphasize the um, devastation caused by Napoleon's wars, but also to um, mm. emphasize how what this would have the implications regarding the restoration. Of course, one of the um, great losses for France during the revolution was the transition of church property into the euphemistic phrase, goods of the nation, in the yes. same way that um, emigre property uh, was by and large confiscated. Um, re regarding the possible restitution of that, obviously the government didn't have the resources, the finances to be able to restore all the property losses that had been incurred as a result of the French Revolution, hence why some people were frustrated by the quote-unquote restoration that restored nothing. But also, France throughout the 19th century, despite some minor innovations such as the introduction of the railway, France was limited in terms of its access to resources that would stimulate industrialization with the exception around um, the eastern boundaries near Belgium, Luxembourg and, um, and Germany. And as a result of that, uh, Prussia, later Germany and even Belgium um, would say, for example, economically modernize faster than France. And for my reckoning, it's only really during the uh, reign of Napoleon III, during the 1850s and the 1860s, um, that there was a serious attempt to ameliorate the devastation and to try and modernize the French economy on par with other European powers. Gotcha. So, yeah, so, I mean, it just seems that uh, France was was broken. Uh, Charles, can you talk to sort of the, the importance of the differentiation between the king of France France and the King of the French? Well, certainly, um, the King of France, uh, the title means that he is Lord of the land. He is the, the ultimate landowner, the ultimate suzerain, mm -hmm. uh, by the grace of God. But Roi des Français, uh, King of the French, was a liberal formulation, and it meant basically that he was mm -hmm. simply the leader of the people. And it's interesting that in later years, when they began creating monarchies in Europe, which were because of their, their period and all that liberal, you had the king of the Belgians, the king of the Albanians, the king of the Bulgarians, the king of the Romanians. I mean, they would be called king of Bulgaria, king of Belgium, etc. the king of the Hellenes. We say king of Greece, king of Bulgaria, but that's not the official title. All of these new monarchies, 
were which were established under quote unquote liberal auspices were uh, the new kings were kings they were the leaders of their people not the lords of the land not traditional mm. monarchs and it seems like a small thing but it's not one of the one of the things in history you know you can tell what something is a small thing or not by simply about whether or not people insist on it you know if it wasn't a big deal then they wouldn't have bothered yeah but it was and so they did uh so by calling himself king of the french as apostolic majesty pointed out very well um he united he was he was louis philippe was trying to plug in to that constitutional monarchy of louis 16th last year he also attempted very much to sort of connect himself to napoleon so he had napoleon's body mm -hmm. brought back from saint helena and entombed where it is now in the Zovalid. uh he pardoned a lot of uh napoleonic figures who had, those who had still survived and were guilty of treason basically after 1815 he pardoned them uh he did a lot of that kind of thing um in the well, end, well, I mean, well i mean um he finished off the construction of the arc de triomphe yes. um his prime minister uh adolf thiers would of course play mm -hmm. an interesting role in the crisis of the early 1870s um, tried even to revive aspects of Napoleonic foreign policy regarding the situation with the left bank of the Rhine. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, with everything, all this ultimately seemed to do was build up anticipation for a Bonapartist restoration, which is, of course, what happened. <laughs> you know, I mean, he, he really, but he was he was in a bad position, really, because as the son of Egalite, as the self-made enemy of legitimism himself, and as, of course, the enemy of Bonapartism, uh, he put himself in a very, very bad situation. Yes, yes. Uh, Louis Philippe was not really in, in a position by any stretch of the imagination to uh, to hold a dynasty for mm. the future. Um, Elena, would you mind talking more about the... Uh, I have the image of the family up here. Yeah. At least um, we have... Uh, we have uh, Louis uh, the 18th. Uh, yes. We have um, Artois. Yes. We have uh, the Duke of uh, Berry and the Duke of, uh, is it Al? Uh, I can't pronounce Angoulême. it. Angoulême. Angoulême. Uh, Berry is in the green. He, he was a very uh, broad shouldered, very muscular young man. The, um, the, Angoulême, there's, he, he was a very, very good general. He had many successes militarily, but he had, I, I don't know if he had Asperger's or what his problem was, but he had a lot of interpersonal uh, problems, inter social skills. He had problems with his social skills and he uh, was, was kind of shy and which was uh, nothing wrong with that, but he had, he was a very, um, unusual man in many ways they they really don't know he's someone they called neurasthenic which it was a term we used in the old days for uh, somebody who had kind of neurological problems but they didn't call it that you know they didn't have that designation anyway the um of course madame royale or the, as she was called then the duchesse d'angoulême is sitting there in the middle. She also, as she and her husband were the last Dauphin and Dauphine of France. And this was during, this picture is during the, the restoration, which, um, and of course the bust in the very middle is of Henri Quatre, Henry IV, who everything they did, they tried to, they even brought back some of the fashions, the, the rough and everything, the things that were worn in the reign of Henry IV and their anthem, was Vivon Ricatra, which was from an opera. And that was almost like their national anthem. That was still the anthem of royal France. And uh, Tchaikovsky wove it into Sleeping Beauty. But mm. it's a beautiful, beautiful, um, the anthem of royal France, really, that was the kind of the national anthem of the country, except it wasn't, it wasn't called that. So um, now what did you, what did you want me to tell you? What was the, just the, you, you gave a decent amount of the per, the family dynamics. So yeah, the, um, all right. 
family dynamics were uh, Angoulême and his wife, Marie Antoinette's daughter, did not have children. And they tended to be, they were very, very conservative. Well, Angoulême wasn't conservative at first. He was with his his uncle. He and his uncle, Louis XVIII, were more more liberal. Whereas the Duc de Berry was, and uh, Marie Therese and Comte d'Artois were, were very conservative. And they were they, they called the ultra, the ultras. They wanted things to return to the way they were. They thought France was happier the way it was. And Charles, the, when Charles X, Artois became Charles X, he said, I would rather chop wood than rule like a king in England. He did not want a <laughs> parliamentary system. He really didn't think that the French would, the French had no tradition of a parliamentary system the way they had in England, they had a different, they had the Parlement, which were the law courts. They had a lot of local self-government mm. in the different French parts of France. And even among the villages and the little towns, they had a, a, a lot of uh, self-government. And um, But they didn't have the tradition that the English had that goes back to the Anglo-Saxons and the Witton and everything. They And of course, the glorious, so-called glorious revolution, really became the king and had of England and Queens of England had lost more and more power after the Stuarts. They really, you know, had lost so much of anything that you would want to call power. They really began to reign rather than to rule. And Charles X dreaded that he did not want that at all. And he said, I will, you know, I would rather ride in a tumbler to the gu guillotine or, and, um, of course, Talleyrand said, well, why don't you just get in a stagecoach and go <laughs> away? That was, yes. Talleyrand was never much of a help. I mean, he, he was helping everybody all the time. But anyway, that's a whole other story. So that's in my novel, Madame Royale. All of this is goes, my novel, Madame Royale, goes into the ins and outs of all of this. Now, what's interesting point that I wanted to mention is that um, Charles X, he, he tried to keep France from becoming a parliamentary system. He revived some of the medieval laws, especially those about desecrating the Blessed Sacrament. There were a lot of desecrations of the Eucharist and of churches were going on among the young revolutionaries. And Charles X revived some of the old laws. And of course, the liberals had a complete meltdown. I mean, it was just the way they are now. They had a complete meltdown so there was another revolution but uh but a lot of people don't realize that this revolution in 1830 called they call the july revolution had been prophesied by saint catherine Labore, uh who was a at the time was a novice of the uh, actually she was a postulant of the daughters of charity at the rue de bac in paris she had a vision of christ the king in his in his um royal garments like gar garbed like a king of france and the garments were stripped off of him. So she knew there was going to be something that was going to happen to the king. And also then she had the miraculous metal apparitions, uh, which is, you know, the miraculous metal has the year 1830 on it. So all of these, these supernatural events were tied up with the end of the Bourbon, the true Bourbon rule in France and the July Revolution, and Charles X being the last king to be anointed with the um, Holy Ampoule. The Holy Ampoule had the oil that had been brought, they said had been brought from heaven to saint Remy when he anointed and baptized and anointed Clovis at Reims uh, in, you know, when it back, at, you know, the, Clovis became the first king of the Franks back several, you know, about a thousand years earlier more than a thousand years. So it was, that was the end of the, there was a supernatural element to all of this in the Madame Royale. It was mentioned in the book, Madame Royale, and also with the miraculous metal apparitions. Now, uh, you know that both Henri and Louise were brought up and very religiously by the Duke and Duchess d'Angoulême so uh, there's actually a stained glass window at the Basilica 
of Saint Anne d'Auré in Brittany with Henry's uh, mother, Caroline, Caroline, and his aunt, who was uh, like his second mother, Marie Therese, both of them praying before Saint Anne, which is very interesting. Now, her um, Caroline's second husband, who was Count Ettore de Lucchese Pali, he was a scion of one of the first families of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. He was also known as Prince of Campo Franco, later as Duke della Grazia. He and Caroline had a castle at Brunzi in Graz, Austria, and that's where she died in 1870. Luis died earlier. She was married to uh, Carlo III, the Duke of Parma. After Carlo's assassination in 1854, Luis was regent until her son Robert I came of age. And as Charles, our Charles here just said, that Henri, the Comte de Chambord, helped, um, was kind of a mentor to Robert I. Now, Robert had 24 children, one of whom became oh. Empress Vita. Charles, do you want to take it from there so we, uh, to get the Zeta part in? Well, certainly. Um, when uh, Robert, of course, was a boy, when uh, his, his duchy was annexed by the Sardinians in 1859, and so he was he was in a particularly peculiar uh, position uh, in that he lived partly in um, Austria, which by the by the uh, mid nineteenth century Austria became a sort of refuge mm -hmm. for the German monarchs. The Portuguese yeah. uh, Miguelists, Don Miguel, moved there. The Carlists moved there. Uh, the Conde de Chambord, well before him, Charles the Tenth moved there. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Naples of the two Sicilies moved there, and finally the, Na the uh, Bourbons of Parma. So he um, he was mentored, as I've said, by uh, Chambord, who, when he died, left him the great Chateau de Chambord that had been given to him by national subscription as as a boy, the Chambord. He gave it to the Duke of Parma, and so Zita, when she was young. Uh, she and the whole family would go on these sort of migratory trips across Europe between mm. Chambord, Luca, where she was born, and Austria. Mm. And they had homes in all these places. Uh, 24 children, uh, <laughs> servants. It was a mass migration <laughs> several times a year. So this had several repercussions. One is that the uh, uh, the 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 young Zita got to know a lot of Bourbon relatives and Braganza Portuguese Braganza relatives, and in many ways she sort of epitomized in herself and in what she was taught the totality of Western European legitimism. Mm. Now, and I'm taking that a step beyond merely French legitimism. Mm -hmm because it emphasizes not simply a legitimate royal line, but a legitimate monarchy. Uh, it's, it's no great shock that the Neo-Jacobite revival in England in the late 1800s was caused by uh, English Catholics who had worked with the Carlists or the Miguelists or the Legitimists. They turned around, they looked at their own country and said, well, when was the last time we had a monarchy of the sort that the French, the Portuguese, the Spanish we know are trying to re restore. Well, all the way back in 1688. That's when. And in Austria, <clears throat> they had an example of a functioning modern monarchy where the monarch had, in, again, in Franz Josef's words, sufficient power to try to protect his people from their politicians. And that at the end of the day, if you cut it down to its barest bones, that was what the Carlists wanted, it's what the Miguelists wanted, it's what the Count de Chambord wanted. The mm -hmm. ability to protect their people from the, in a certain sense, in a modern state, almost essential, and yet never trustworthy tools. Um, the political class, remember that the modern state had began to arise in the 16th, 17th century, but came of age with the French Revolution. 
uh, the, the modern bureaucratic state, which showed it could function, A, without a monarch, and B, it didn't need to pay any attention to, to what it governed either. And that was the exactly. origin of the modern political class. So yes. they did something that neither neither kings and nobles on the one side or, or commoners, workers, and peasants on the other could do, which is run the modern state. But left to themselves, they would run it into the ground. And that, that was the great fear of uh, Europe's monarchs. I'll just say this is really a little off, off kilter, but it's worth pointing out. And that is that by 1914, even in Austria, Russia, and Germany, the monarchs no longer had control of the state. And the proof of the pudding is that in 1902, when, uh, or 1903, when the Tsar and the Kaiser went on their famous cruise to the Baltic, they signed a treaty of friendship and alliance, which was immediately denounced mm. by their governments when they got back to their respective capitals. Mm. Uh, now, remember, this is the time, this is before the 1905 revolution in Russia. So basically, and again, this is far afield. But if you want to assign blame to the horrors of 1914 and subsequent mm. years, you have no further to look than an untrammeled political class able to do exactly what it wanted to. I totally agree. As they say, when, you, when you're talking to Charles or when Charles writes a book, you learn about all of history. At, uh, Absolutely. At once. Um, and so... The the royalists these the ultra royalists and um and what was the secondary party was it just the royalists or what what was the like? Well, you had the uh, ultra royalists. You had the um, they had different names for them. None of them really complimentary. But the the <laughs> constitutional monarchists. Um, then of course you had republicans still, mm. and you still had Bonapartists. So you've got four parties basically. What were the sort of, uh, so there was the July ordinances and um, as well as sort of the dynamic of, is it the Department of Deputies? How, how did that function in uh, the restoration France? Could I, sorry, Connor, could I um, briefly come back to a point that Elena made a while ago? I, I just didn't want to lose this point. Now you're on to the yeah. structure of the restoration government, uh, yes. which was... Henri IV, uh, Henry IV, uh, and the bringing back of the, the popular song uh, "Vive, uh, vive uh, le roi Henri," and uh, yeah. the, even the bringing back of the ruff, as you can see here on this image. Um, yes. It seems like a rather curious case, doesn't it, for the the, the Catholic legitimists to venerate Henri IV, so doesn't it, considering, of course, he was very much a political pragmatist, was brought up as a Huguenot, tried mm -hmm. to exert, tried to basically turn France Huguenot for the first five years of his reign, then throws it mm -hmm. away, says uh, Paris is worth the mass, <laughs> and converts to Catholicism. Mm -hmm. So it seems a rather interesting figure, doesn't it, that Henry IV should be the standard bearer of the Restoration, and not Louis Le Grand, not Louis XIV. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, you can say that in the spirit of the type of government that Louis XVIII was trying to bring about, Louis XVIII didn't want to be associated with the grandeur and the absolutism of Louis XIV. Indeed, to be seen as so disconnected from the concerns mm -hmm. of the lower classes, even though that's a very unfavorable reading of Louis XIV, nevertheless, mm -hmm. it was a popular reading of Louis XIV. So Henri Cat represents that position as the first Bourbon monarch after the collapse of the de Valois, the man who brings in the white flag as the royal standard, albeit there are many myriad flags of France at that time. But he is also the man who is able to bring peace back to France after the 30 years before the wars of religion. So in terms of a figure who is seen as, you can say, embracing all of the aspects of what the restoration government wants to bring about after the tumult of the revolution, Henri Cat therefore is a very salient figure 
to represent that restoration. Regarding your point about how the new government functioned, as, as it, um, in many senses is the restoration that restored nothing, this was not a restoration of the government pre-1791 mm -hmm. when Louis the Sixteenth ruled as a quote-unquote absolute monarch. And Elena has already brought up the uh, the provincial nature of French politics, the fact that France didn't have a parliament in the uh, the, the English sense, but had a system of law courts, parlement, uh, the largest one, of course, being Paris, the others mm. being uh, uh, distributed in the, uh, the extremities of France. When the revolutionary government uh, took hold of France in the early 1790s, these regional distinctions were abolished and replaced by a system of département, which were not based mm -hmm. on any existing uh, legal structures or governmental forms. Instead, they were designed to basically represent geographic features so as to eliminate these aspects of local autonomy. This was a vehicle of centralization in France. And yes. of course, you have the National Convention with the advent of the French Republic, the, the, the terminology changes. And you can say that the Chamber of Deputies is simply the latest iteration. Before then, it had been, uh, if I remember, the uh, court legislatif, uh, the legislative courts, yeah. um, which had administered the French Napoleonic Empire. So many of the, the constitutional legal mechanisms had simply been inherited taken over by the Bourbons from Napoleon. In fact, you can say that um, the Bourbon government really didn't really change at all when Napoleon took power. You simply replaced the Bourbons with Napoleon, who was a far more active head of state than Louis XVIII. You replaced the personages. But in terms of the political system itself, the Charter of 1814 roughly remained the same. And therefore, you can understand that Charles X and the ultra royalists would, um, when they actually win a, a majority in the Chamber of Deputies, they declare themselves the uh, the unfindable chamber. They declare themselves that they will not recognize the body to which they have been elected in an, mm. an ultimately a futile attempt to force the king to abolish the body in which they are now the majority and restore real royal authority to France. This does not happen. And so you can say the Napoleonic settlement, therefore, becomes the basis of most of the French governments throughout the remainder of the 19th century, even down to the idea of the Concordat being the basis of the revolu of the of the religious settlement in France from the beginning of the 19th century, all the way up until 1905, when you have the declaration of the separation of church and state. Um, so in many ways, as I would say, it was a restoration that restored nothing. What year Bruce. was um, that uh, that they tried to get the king to uh, dissolve the Department of Deputies? Uh, if I remember, I can't. I've 1818 or 1819, mm -hmm. so a couple of years uh, after after the um, Battle of Waterloo, um, there was an attempt to purge the army and the administration of many uh, Bonapartists, people who had gone along with the Restoration 1814, and then turncoat when Napoleon comes back from Elba. The most obvious of these examples, of course, is Marshal Ney, um, who had promised to bring Napoleon back to Paris in an iron cage and then switch his sides uh, when encountering Napoleon, oh. then fights at the Battle of Waterloo, comes back and um, is shot by firing squad for his treason to the Bourbon monarchy. So after this, um, the royalists on the back of, you can say, the uh, frustration with Napoleon and the disaster of Waterloo and the decimation of the Bonapartists elect the ultra-royalists in a huge majority. Um, but it, you can say is the king more than anyone else who holds this constitutional settlement together. You know, I, I, that's that's very true. And it there were, there were a couple of other items too, just referring back to uh, Henry IV, you're quite right. I mean, he was seen as the man who who put Humpty Dumpty back together. Uh, but beyond that, in addition to the notion of uh, Louis XIII and XIV, XIV especially being somewhat separate from the people, uh, a lot of the great counter-revolutionary writers of the Restoration, uh, de Mest, de Bonal, and people like that, partly attributed the revolution to what they consider the over-centralization and the establishment of the modern state under Louis XIV and Louis XV, pointing to Colbert in particular mm -hmm. as kind of a, a villain in the piece. So <clears throat> from their standpoint, uh, 
the monarchy of uh, Louis XIV was actually the gateway to the revolution. And their ideas were very popular amongst the proponents of the restoration. Uh -huh. um, so you've got all these different things at play. So Henri IV seemed uh, like the perfect poster child for what they were trying to accomplish. Yes. Yes. May I, can I make a point about um, Henri IV is another interesting little thing is that Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette uh, admired Henri IV and tried to identify with him and kind of show that they were going back to those days as much as they could. And that is why Marie Antoinette would dress at the Khmer Park costume ball. She would go dressed as the mistress of Henri IV, Gabrielle d'Astre, la belle Gabrielle. And she wanted to show, that was her way of showing she was her husband's mistress as well as his wife. And that la belle Gabrielle would go on campaign with Henri IV and would cook food over an open fire and, and uh, took care of him in the camp. And uh, so she was kind of, you know, and Henry, Henry the Fourth had the, he had the common touch. He would just talk to everybody. He was very well beloved of the French people. The Bourbons in general were known to have the common touch that they could mm. speak to anybody. And you know, even the Louis the Fourteenth, the they were approachable to the people. I mean, they were greatly reverenced, but they were also very approachable, and they were known to help the people directly. So that. Um, is kind of the theme of Henri Catra kind of keeps recurring throughout the lives of the the Bourbons. I'm I'm surprised they didn't look up like uh make uh Saint Louis the uh much more of the symbol for the dynasty. I mean I know he wasn't a a Bourbon in the sen in that sense as uh uh Henry was. Well, but he he did it, Madame Royale, uh, Marie Therese tried to bring a lot of uh, St. Louis, and uh, there was a lot of res rest restoring of the Gothic style came back. Yeah. And when they had the last coronation, the coronation of Charles X, they tried to make it as medieval as possible. So there was a lot of, you know, the son of St. Louis, and a lot of that was brought back. But there was so much anti Catholic, St. Louis being a saint, there was so much anti Catholic. Of uh, a uh, feeling at the time, and especially in politics. But no, they did. They did try to use him, but he wasn't as popular. He wasn't as popular with and as a legendary as as Henri Quatre. Henri Quatre's. Um, he was the only body in at the Cathedral of, of Basilica of Saint Denis who the who the revolutionaries didn't ransack his coffin. They ransacked mm -hmm. all the other saints. I and mean, then kings and queens, and some of whom we were, you know, were saints. Some of them were absolutely weren't. But the revolutionaries, when they sacked and pillaged the tombs at Saint Denis, they didn't touch Henri IV, which is very interesting. There's another interesting note, just uh, because I just researched this recently. It wasn't also that they didn't ransack um, the body of um, the, the body of him, Henri IV. It's that uh, it was remarkably well preserved as well compared to the other bodies as well. So there was an aspect of veneration for the mm. body as much as the person. Mm. That's really it's, interesting. Uh, wow. It is, It is though, too. Uh, you'll recall that when Louis XVI was murdered, uh, the, the, mm -hmm. um, the phrase of the Abbe Edgeworth, uh, son of St. Louis, ascend to heaven. Yes. And it's just for completeness' sake. In uh, Quebec, from the time of uh, the king's murder for the next 20 years or 30 years or longer, whenever you see a painting of St. Louis done in Quebec in those days, he has the face of Louis XVI. Oh, how wow. beautiful. Interesting. I didn't know that. That's really, well, that you know, we, we, really cool. Until the Revolution Tronqui, the way that uh, we French Canadians used to distinguish ourselves from the, uh, the uh, Metropolitan is that we would say, well, you know, we're the French who didn't murder our king. <laughs> oh. Not that there's any rivalry or dislike between the two. <laughs> yes, it's dangerous a, ha having you, a French of, um, Canadian, on. Sorry, just a final point of uh, clarification, um, Connor, regarding your point that 
um, Louis the Ninth, uh, Saint Louis wasn't a Bourbon. Um, all I believe all of the uh, current Bourbons legitimists are direct descendants of Louis the Ninth uh, through yes. his younger son Robert, uh, Comte de Clermont. Indeed, all the, the Valois monarchs are descended from Saint Louis, and uh, all the mainline Capetians are. So Saint Louis, you can say, is the uh, the monarch at which all of the lines, royal lines of France, descend. Yeah, well, thank and you they, for clarifying that. Uh, yes, and the revolutionaries themselves brought up Saint Louis by calling Louis the Sixteenth Citizen Capet. They I'm gave sorry. him the name of Le Saint Louis, his last name, oh. Louis Citizen Capet, and and Widow Capet. Marie Antoinette was Widow Capet, and mm -hmm. uh, Little Louis the Seventeenth was Charles Capet. So, and they called uh, Madame Royale Charlotte Capet. So it was very um, interesting. So they were making the connection in yes. a weird way. Okay. In a weird way, yes. These we talked about the murder of the Duke of Berry. So um, it, it this is these are just good images of him looking uh, very royal and his assassination. Mm -hmm. um, and we have Charles the Tenth and uh, Louis Philippe's uh, uh, rise as king of the French. Um, now. Now, this is the Count of Ch Chambord as an adult. Uh, he was so he was gifted the um, the Chateau uh, uh, Chambord. Uh, and how much did he live there? I don't think did he ever really get to live there? Did he never live there for I, a few days in the 1870s? Okay, <laughs> isn't that something? That's kind of interesting. Yeah, it was more. It was an honorary. They, they, I mean, the French people did say saved up money and bought it. It was a gift to him as a little boy when he was Duke de Bordeaux. But he never really. I don't, yeah, when they were still in France, ruling in France, I don't think he ever really got to stay there. But I'm glad he got to stay there at least maybe you know in the 1870s. That's wonderful. He did. He um, he. In fact, when he wrote his farewell letter to the French. In uh, 1871, that was the first time he had stayed there, and he uh, he wrote his letter begins, uh, French. I am in the midst of you. You opened the doors of France to me, and I could not deny myself the happiness of seeing my homeland again. Uh, but I don't want to give by a prolonged presence new pretext for the agitation of minds so troubled at this moment. Uh, I am therefore proudly. I am therefore leaving Chambord which you gave me and whose name I have proudly borne for 40 years on the paths of exile. By moving away from it, I want to tell you, I am not separating myself from you. France knows that I belong to her. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Was, was the Count, I mean, it seems oh. like the thing that the Count of Chambord was trying to avoid when he had the opportunity of becoming possibly the King of France was to n avoid a restoration that restored nothing. Is that, uh, well, is that, that accurate? See, he'd already you know, been there, done that. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, exactly right. And I mean, uh, even though the, he did it's not. interesting. Yeah. Charles, were you saying something? Uh, he did not want to be in the same position Charles X had been in, and he did not want to be a king like the King of England. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting that as early as 1865, he wrote to the workers of France uh, when they, they uh, passed a law in 1865 under the, uh, <clears throat> under the, uh, uh, the emperor. The uh, labor problem became very big and there were no trade unions because the Le Chapelier law of 1791 that had abolished the uh, the guilds in France was used to prevent labor from organizing unions. So uh, the Côte de Chambord wrote a letter intervening in the issue and calling for, you guessed it, unions. And he mm -hmm. gives a long, a long list of why. And he ends it by saying, in short, the right of association under the supervision of the state 
and with the help of this multitude of admirable works, previous precious fruits of the evangelical virtues. Such are the principles which seem to serve effectively to untie the complicated knot of labor issue. In other words, he's calling for a restoration of the guilds. Who does not see, moreover, that the voluntary and regulated constitution of free corporations would become one of the most powerful elements of order and social harmony, and that these corporations could enter into the organization of the commune and into the electorate and uh, suffrage bases, uh, a consideration which touches on one of the most serious points of the policy of the future. Especially, this is how he ends it, <clears throat> especially in the face of present difficulties, does it not seem that, faithful to all the traditions of its glorious past, truly Christian and truly French royalty must do today for the emancipation and the moral and material prosperity of the workers, what she did in other times for the emancipation of the communes? Is it not up to her, meaning French royalty, to call the working people to enjoy freedom and peace under the necessary guarantee of authority, mm. under the spontaneous tutelage of devotion, and under the auspices of Christian charity? Now, he wanted yeah. to be able, in other words, to intervene in the life of the nation in that manner. And the sort of monarchy that was being offered was not that monarchy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you wanted, if you want, he was in favor of what was called in those days a uh, monarchy social. What does that mean? A social monarchy. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Uh, also, just a, a, a quick brief um you know we uh the louis philippe loses his throne and then it becomes a republic then uh the uh, louis napoleon uh becomes the president prince president i think that's what it and then he becomes emperor so the liberals get what they want this prince president kind of that's what they were looking for and even he makes it into uh, uh an emperor an imp uh, emperorship and, uh, you know, eventually, you know, through his own sort of bipolar nature where he's going from in between a, <laughs> um, a monarch, you know, a monarch who's uh, a Catholic monarch to back to a liberal, he sort of sets himself up alienated from everyone uh, in, uh, dip in, in the diplomatic area, which leads to his uh, the defeat in the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, and that's where uh, the Count of Chambord becomes a possibility of restoration. And that's where we're talking about his, um, you know, what he wanted to do with this uh, monarchy that he was looking for, that he was willing to be the king of. Um, and it seems, uh, Elena, you and I discussed uh, Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette and their uh, sort of uh, them reaching out to, to, to um, the poor and yes. trying to be charitable. It yes. seems like the Count of Chambord was trying to uh, or would have wanted to do something similar in, 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 the, in the context of the Industrial Revolution. Oh, absolutely. He, he would have. They, France would not have gone through some of the upheavals and the difficulties that they did go through with um, that, that all those liberal socialists wrote novels about and everything. You know, if, if they had had the Comte de Chambord as king, a, a real king, they would not have gone through that as bad. It was a very difficult time. But the, the charity, the charitable um, work of the church was something that was of always a big part of the Bourbon monarchy. In fact, of the kings and queens of France in general, it was especially as seen as being the providence of the queen and the princesses, or especially were to, to handle things like that. That was all, you know, there was no social security. There was no welfare state. It, everything was done by the church and uh, sponsored by people of means or pe people of influence, such as the queen and the princesses and all the noble ladies, all the duchesses, all of them ran charities and took care of the poor. And I'm sure that uh, uh, Madame, Madame Royale de, de Chastangoulême, she was incredibly charitable all back during the restoration. She did incredible char charitable work. People didn't know it though, because she was very 
private about it. She wanted it to be like our Lord said, let not your right hand know what your left hand is doing. So Madame Royale, the Duchess of Angoulême did not um, advertise her, her, her charitable work works. Many people never knew half of what she did. Same was what was with Marie Antoinette. I uh, continue to find out of things that she had been doing and people she'd been helping that I'd never heard of before. And that most people don't hear of. And you just, they just recently found her rosary in England. It was with a family, an uh, old recusant family, Catholic family had Marie Antoinette's rosary that had been given them by Abbe Edgeworth who was her husband's confessor and escorted him to the guillotine. He was later became the confessor of the, the Duchesse d'Angoulême. Now, uh, this rosary, how they said that one of the things with this rosary is that they said she was giving people rosaries all the time. And I had never heard of Marie Antoinette handing out rosaries. And I thought it was very interesting. But apparently that is a story. I haven't, haven't found something else to substantiate it. But that in itself is interesting. So there's always more to find out about the Catholicism of the various people, even the people that didn't seem, you know, necessarily to be devout. Like Charles X, he had actually, in his later years, was very, very religious. So there's always more to find out. But I, you're absolutely right. I'm sure Charles um, Henry V would have been such a wonderful Catholic king. Um, yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the um, one of the saddest things about European monarchy in general is that um, the coulda, woulda, the coulda, woulda, shoulda is sometimes absolutely overwhelming when you look at the results. I was interviewed today by a um, a newspaper in Britain, um, and they asked what I found so compelling about monarchy in general, and I said, well. I, I, there were a number of things I was able to say, but the first thing I said was, if you look at it historically, never has a monarchy been replaced by something better. Mm -mm. Never. Even even monarchies that I wouldn't have wanted to live under, like the you know, Ottoman sultans or the Qing uh, emperors in China, you know, they would still does better than yeah. Ataturk and Mao. I mean, oh my <laughs> heavens! Oh, I, by but, all means. But somehow that never seems to get into people's heads. You know, you have a king, yeah. and yeah, there are problems, there are difficulties, human beings are not nice. You get rid of them, and there's bloodshed, war, and famine. But that's good. <laughs> well, yeah. let, let's get into the politics of the final uh, uh, setup for uh, the counter Trump board. What kept him from becoming king? Uh, Patrice McMahon became the president of um uh of, of France of the French Rep well it wasn't the French Rep was it the French Republic yet or had yeah, it been it declared um, okay. before because um, he becomes president just a few months before the uh serious attempted at restoration even though there had been musings about it two years before um I'm a bit of a revisionist here when I I mean it's it's fatalistic or sort of, um, I, I would say, counterproductive to look at the Third Republic as a fait accompli with the fall of um, Napoleon III. Um, Napoleon III, I mean, you mentioned the social monarchy, but a lot of the aspects of a active Catholic monarchy had already been established with Napoleon III. He, of course, was the author of the extinction of pauperism, and he, of course, was responsible for the creation of France's first trade unions in 1864. Indeed, he was responsible for, you can say, liberalizing the press in the latter part of the mm -hmm. 1860s, which created the conditions for legitimist organizations to begin seriously touting the idea of the return of Chambord. Um, the result of the Franco-Prussian War was a, a disaster for Catholics in Europe, yeah. because not only did it result in the defeat of Napoleon III, who had defended Catholics in France, but he was also responsible for defending the last vestige of the papal states with Pius IX's domain in Rome, which of course was lost in the result of the French troops being pulled out. And of course, the diplomatic consequences being less severe now that the Second Empire has fallen. And of course, not only do you have the conquest of Rome, 
by the excommunicated uh, Sardinian monarchy. Not only do you have the fall of Napoleon III, you have the Paris Commune taking over, which is again explicitly anti-Catholic, and you see many of the recurring motifs of the reign of terror coming back in Paris during 1870 and 1871. And to top all of that off, the man who has now become the ascendant honest broker of the continent, uh, Otto von Bismarck, is completely mm -hmm. paranoid about any sort of Catholic power in Europe mm -hmm. that could possibly damage the Hohenzollern monarchy or his uh, personal position of power as chancellor, even causing opposition uh, within the new German foreign ministry. So I see de Comte de Chambord as basically representing some form of Napoleon III continuity character to many French before a legitimist or the true monarch of France, strangely enough. Because after the disaster of the Commune and the defeat of France after um, the Franco-Prussian War, during the Franco-Prussian War, the Bonapartist dynasty were fully discredited. And the Orleanists were still associated with the failed, the failed July monarchy of Louis-Philippe. Thereby, the Comte de Chambord represented the best possible alternative to a basically a Napoleon III-style government. Now, that has become completely out of the question. However, very quickly into the situation, this is stymied by the clever politicking of Adolf Thiers, who tries to stabilize the French Republic, appeal to Orleanists and appeal to Republicans at the same time as basically representing a, a force of stability and harmony between these various factions. And of course, bringing in a lot of people who have been uh, discredited by the Napoleonic government back into France and leaning on them for support. But of course, this only lasts a couple of years, that collapses. And by 1863, there is no real pressure from the left or some political strength that can prevent the attempted restoration of the Comte de Chambord. And uh, Patrice Marmahon, of course, uh, was the, uh, you can say, the generalissimo of the Second French Empire, even though he had been defeated at the Battle of Sedan um, alongside Napoleon III, uh, he still had an exceptional amount of military prestige. And so when he was elected uh, the second president of the Third French Republic, uh, he was so, I believe, unanimously. But of course, even though he had this unanimous recognition, it was still essentially as a regent for the would-be king, the Comte de Chambord, because Mahmahon himself was a legitimist, he was a monarch monarchist, mm -hmm. and he was a devout Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's enough with, with, with me trying to set this up, but um, I would like to sort of pass the floor when it comes to the actual mechanics of the failed restoration. Mm. Well, you've, uh, you've done a very, very good job in setting the stage. Uh, there are, too, a couple of, of other things to be borne in mind. One is that uh, Charette uh, de la Contrie, who was the, uh, uh, the commander of the papal Zouaves, the French Zouaves, who, when Napoleon III pulled out of Rome, they returned to France to fight in the Franco-Prussian War. So Charette de la Contrie, uh, is also a great, as one of the very few French leaders not discredited, French military leaders not discredited. His troops performed very well in combat. Mm -hmm. He's in favor of the restoration and is also one of the ringleaders of the Vieux National, which to atone for the horrors of the revolution, etc., will make the Vieux National, the national vow, to build the... Uh, the uh, mm -hmm. That's, that's Sacred, so Heart. Uh, Sacred Heart, Sacred Heart, yes. That's the one. Um, and at that moment, in that period of time, believe it or not, the cause of the Sacred Heart and the cause of Chambord are mm. tightly linked. Yes, absolutely. And that, uh, this presents a problem, however, because if Chambord is to be restored, it has to be with the assent of all the politicians, the major politicians in France. And now you come to the basic issue. They do not want to surrender any amount of real power to a king. 
and Shambor does not want to be a king without real power. So the flag issue, you know, is almost a test case. Mm -hmm. Because if he couldn't get his way on something relatively minor, on a trapping, he certainly yeah. wasn't going to get it on anything else. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. let's say that uh, let's say that he uh, and there's some evidence to suggest this that he was uh, interested in replacing the département with the old provinces. If he couldn't get the flag he wanted in, <laughs> how likely was it he'd be able to be able to get rid of the département? <laughs> how likely would it be that he'd be able to uh, do any of the social reorganization he had in mind? Very unlikely. Well, before the agreement of France's major politicians, and of course there was a ascendant and aggressive Republican faction led by Leon Gambetta, who will ultimately take over the Republic in the, over the ensuing 10 years, before no. even the idea of bringing harmony to France's various political factions, uniting them around the idea of a legitimate restoration, you have the concern of actually getting the army on side to support yes. the restoration. And Patrice MacMahon, of course, was the chief of state. He was the commander of the French armed forces in the wake of the collapse of the Second Empire. And he could not maintain the loyalty of the troops if they were to surrender the Troika law, which of course had been associated with the military glories of Napoleon, mm -hmm. and replace it with the white flag. So if the army couldn't side with something as simple as the changing of the flag, then the idea that the politicians of France could unite behind it was frankly preposterous. So in the end, uh, it was stuck basically basically having to say that he, uh, if he couldn't do what he wanted to do, there was no point doing anything. Mm -hmm. May I ask and, a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no. Sorry, Elena, what was the, what were you going to Oh, I just wanted to ask Charles and his apostolic majesty if they know anything about, uh, uh, I always heard that the wife of the Comte de Chambord the, uh, did not, she ha ha did not want to live in France. She was afraid of France because of all the stories of the revolution and that she was dead set against him accepting the crown and that she, that her, I don't know what you've heard. I don't know if, if this is true or not, but if her her revulsion against France had anything to do with him just not going. In terms of <clears throat> in terms of her, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily say it was revulsion against France. I would say it was mm -hmm. legitimate concern. Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. The, the disastrous situation of all of France's previous governments. I mean, exactly. Just, yes, yes, exactly. She said, why Why would we have a nice life here? Why are we going to go in, in the middle of this disaster? Exactly. Just to emphasize this point, Napoleon was chased out of power twice. Louis XVIII yeah. was chased out of power once. Charles X was chased out of power. Louis Philippe was chased out of power. And now yes. Napoleon III. <laughs> <has been chased laughs> yeah, out of power. exactly. Even had he been accepted, he accepted the idea of a compromise settlement, the idea of the, the white flag as the standard of the monarchy and the tricolor as the standard of France. The idea is essentially that he would have already compromised, diminished his position, and 10 years later, he would have been overthrown and they would be back in Schloss Frosdorf. <laughs> yeah. What, yes. what did they want from Char or from Henry, uh, uh, the Count of Chambord? What did they want? What would they gain by having him being uh, this sort of uh, figurehead or, or, um, or even just being a sort of a Napoleonic monarch? And not a full mind. Uh, sorry, just a thought is another, another thought has just occurred to me. I think something else which really needs to be understated in terms of mm -hmm. you can always say that the Comte de Chambord was a man who was running out of time. If he was going to achieve these reforms to France, such as the reformation of the Departement, the preservation of the Catholic Church, you can even say the rejuvenation of the Catholic Church, yes. the restoration of elements of the pre revolution monarchy. And indeed, on top of that, the restoration of the flag, he was childless. And yes. after the reconciliation of uh, the Count of Paris, the descendant of Louis Philippe, it was basically accepted, even though, as Charles mentioned at the earlier part of the stream, that there were, of course, 
closer relatives to Chambord living in Spain, it would have been far simpler, far more acceptable for the French population to have the Count of Paris succeed the Comte de Chambord. Yes. But of course, what that would have meant is as soon as you have an Orleanist on the throne, everything that the Comte de Chambord would have worked towards would have been thrown away. And you have the restoration of the citizen kingship. You have the restoration of the King of the French and the tricolor. Yes. So if Henry V was going to come back, he needed to stamp his notion of monarchy and present it to his successor, the Count of Paris, as something that yes. France could not deviate from. Otherwise, everything would be in vain. Yeah, kind of. Yes. Uh, I, I believe you're right there. I do believe you're right. Yeah. Kind of like uh, Queen Mary and uh, Queen Elizabeth. Yes, uh, well, yeah. will be less dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> less, yes. less dramatic. Although it is, it is interesting, isn't it? The way the the English and French, uh, the um, English and French restorations uh, were so similar. Mm -hmm. Charles the Second, Louis Eighteenth, yeah. uh, James the Second. Uh, uh, Charles the Tenth, and they, it, it's a funny thing about history. So often the same roles pop up over and over. Yes. But with Henry, yeah, and with with Henry, he uh, he was stuck in the role of James the Third. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, but with exactly. no Charles to succeed him. <laughs> yes. So Hen Henry yeah. doesn't uh, doesn't accept the offer. Uh, MacMahon stabilizes the Third Republic, and that seems to be the end of. Well, it's, um, well, it's worse than that, Connor. He doesn't okay. stabilize the Third Republic. Oh, he doesn't. Which Sorry, is a shame. Um, because oh. him, him stabilizing the government doesn't represent him stabilizing the Third Republic. It represents him stabilizing a French state with some oh. sort of um, <laughs> military guardian to prevent the ascendancy of the Republicans. But of course, when he is removed, there are a series of crises in the latter part of the 1870s, in which mm. his power is first diminished, and then finally he resigns power. Thereafter, you have the restoration of things such as the Marseillaise, the reconciliation of aspects of the Jacobin Revolution, and even the... Um, uh, the pardoning of members of the Paris Commune as well. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Once all of that is done, and once you have the death of the Comte de Chambord, if I remember correctly, in 1883, mm -hmm. there is nothing stopping the French government going, not just against the idea of the restoration of the monarchy, even though the Orleanist, the Count of Paris, is still alive, but against the Catholic Church. You yes. can say there is a yeah. there is a quarter of a century sustained attack on the Catholic Church led by the Republican government, and unfortunately for the French right and French Catholicism, uh, the Republicans win a complete victory. Yeah, yeah, and that that in the end, uh, interestingly enough, although this isn't really quite germane to our uh, our talk, uh, in the eighteen nineties you see the emergence of Chamorras who becomes the theorist of a new sort of, quote-unquote, modern royalism, L'Action Francaise, which will have echoes all over Europe and in Latin America and Quebec, even in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. uh, then the, the House of Orléans, uh, for the first part of the 20th century, actually embraces a great deal of L'Action Francaise. After uh -huh. World War II... This will no longer be the case, but something else is happening. Interesting. There's something else to, to bring us to where we are today with French royalism and to explain why it is the way it is. <clears throat> the uh, Comte de Paris, Henri uh, Sisi, would have been if he were king, um, who was, uh, becomes king, becomes the heir uh, in the uh, 1940s. He works with de Gaulle. Uh, he still pushes for restoration after the war, but he uh, breaks with L'Action Francaise and is considered rather liberal. Well, in the meantime, in the meantime, the Carlist line, which a very few legitimists had insisted with the years, the so-called Blanche d'Espagne, uh, 
they die out. And so their claim to the throne of Spain, as sorry, to the throne of France, <clears throat> goes to the royal house, the reigning royal house of Spain. Oddly enough, because of an old Spanish law that no member of a royal house that had taken up arms against the legitimate royal house could ever be kings, a lot of the mm -hmm. Carlists refused to accept Alfonso XIII as king. Ah. All right. It gets more bizarre. Now, Alfonso XIII goes into exile in 1931. <clears throat> the Civil War breaks out in 36, same year that uh, the Carlos die out. But he has two sons. And the oldest is blind and deaf, Don Jaime. So Don Jaime, it's presumed, won't have any children. And his father gets him to renounce his rights to the throne of Spain. All right. He renounces them. But to everyone's surprise, he marries and produces an heir. Hmm. And that son, Don Alfonso, becomes interested in the throne of France. And he huh? is the refounder, as it were, of the legitimist party of French royalists. Oh, is he the father of the Duc d'Anjou? Precisement. Ah. Now, in the meantime, the Count of Paris has annoyed a lot of his Lexion Francais people. He has he gets into a lot of personal issues, uh, breaks with his wife, who is mm -hmm. universally loved. So, you could say that Don Alfonso, on the one hand, and the Conde de Paris himself, were really responsible for the creation of the modern legitimist party. <laughs> And all we need now is for Macron to be forced from power and for the throne to be reoffered. <laughs> yes. Amen. Yes. The, the the that would be quite glorious. Uh but uh you never know what might occur in the future. Never well, know. We, we never do. And of course, at the end of the day, you know, the, the other interesting thing, um the uh, the old Count of Paris, Audi Cease dies. And his son becomes the claimant. Well, his son was the father of the, of the Duc de Vendôme, who's now Count of Paris. Jean, his name is. But here's the fun thing. And I do say the fun thing. About two months before he died, the, uh, the old Count of Paris, not the sixth, but the seventh, he... Uh, decided to try to consecrate France to the Sacred Heart. Mm -hmm. I never so knew that. Through, yeah, well, it was it was all, all the rage, all the news for a little while. This was like oh. in November of when he died. Uh, oh. What year was it? Uh, 2018, 2019, 2020, oh. something like that. Mm. Very recent. So oh. he orders that the Sacred Heart be put on the family coat of arms. Uh... He, he does all this sort of stuff. And then the following January, a couple of months later, he's getting ready to go to one of the masses for Louis XVI on January 21st of the following mm -hmm. year. He, then he suddenly feels unwell. He can't go. And he dies. Ah. Hmm. Wow. So uh, the Duc de Vendôme becomes the Comte de Paris. He, he doesn't publicly disavow what his father did, but you don't see anything about it in any of the early on East material at all. It's oh. down the memory hole. Mm. That's, oh, that's my but, goodness. And then he, and if that weren't bad enough, uh, his grandfather, the old Conor Putty, um, he, uh, the really old Conor Putty, mm -hmm. uh, he had put the remaining family property, including the Chateau d'Amboise, into the hands of this Fondation Saint-Louis. Mm. And the family had lived there, but last year, the year before, the new counterparty got into a fight with them mm. and has moved out with his family. Interesting. So uh, I, I'm very, very, although I'm not an Orleanist by any stretch, I'm very mm -hmm. sorry that uh, he's been put through that. 
Mm, yeah. that's, that's a pity. Well, uh, Charles, thank you for bringing us to the modern day. Um, uh, let, I think this is a good time to wrap up uh, our episode. Uh, thank you, everyone, for watching. Oh. Uh, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Thank you to all my guests. Uh, Ap Apostolic Majesty did an episode on the Count of Chambord, which I'll have mm -hmm. in the link in the description. Also look out for his future episodes on Petain and um, uh, De Gaulle uh, oh, wow. in, in the series. Uh, and also you should probably start with uh, Napoleon III, ep his episode on Napoleon III. Is also is the beginning of his uh, small series. Um, uh, thank you, Am. Uh, uh, is there anything else? Is there anything I'm forgetting? Um, th thank you for that um, very much, Connor. And again, thank you for having me on. Um, I recently did um, a little sort of um, inquiry into the devastation, the iconoclasm of the French Revolution as well. If people mm -hmm. want to talk to that. But thank you again for having me on. Awesome. And that's with uh, John D, right? Yep. Yep. Awesome. Elena, thank you for uh, coming thank on. Thank you, sweetie. Uh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Charles and, and his Ma Apostolic Majesty. It's been a cre credible honor. I've learned so much from both of you. Thank you very much. You can find oh, Elena's work at uh, T at Trianon. I'll have the link for that in the description. Uh, her books are also uh, uh, important to look at. Uh, she has she's currently working on her sequel to a series on Henrietta Maria, and yes. so which will uh, take place during the um, English Civil War. Uh, so yes. that's an exciting upcoming uh, book. Uh, Charles, the great Charles Coulomb of the of uh, off the menu over at Tumblr House. And what what's the second second podcast you've recently started? Uh, it's a purely historical thing. It's called The Neverending Struggle at Virgin Most Powerful Radio, uh, vmpr.org. Uh, oh. And the yeah, it's 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 all new stuff. Um, after the Easter break, we're resuming our off the menu podcasts tomorrow. So oh, Monday good. will be. We'll be back, uh, back to normal. And um, <clears throat> I've just done a, a piece, believe it or not, on the viceroys in the Commonwealth for The Rural, which is a magazine out of Jersey. And I don't mean the, the, uh, the, uh, phone, the real one in America. The I mean island. The, phony one, the, the yeah. island. Yes. So, it's uh, so it it it's uh, it's been a very busy time. Uh, yeah. I've got stuff at Catholicism.org, at Crisis, at Peter One yeah. Five or One One Peter Five. <laughs> and you're, you're, uh, you've been writing for the European Conservative lately too, haven't you? Yes, yeah, I sure have. Thank that's you. That's a one too. Yeah, I, follow, I follow you around. Oh, um. that's oh, called stalking, young lady. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you was. <laughs> Check out Charles' work. Also, uh, the as I mentioned, Blessed Char or Blessed Emperor Charles' uh, book, uh, and as well mm -hmm. as Star Spangled Crown, is uh, a fun uh, book about a future, uh, a hypothetical future monarchy in the United States. Uh, if, so, if anybody's interested in that, um, I'm uh, putting together in the future maybe uh, a, sort of the week after the uh, the coronation of King Charles III, I'm working on a um, a, a panel regarding it. Um, so uh, look out for that. That'll be a very exciting episode. Uh, so thank you all for watching again. Thank you, honey. Um, and uh, you please, please share this episode. I think there's a lot of people that need to know about the Count of Chambord as well as legitimism and... Uh, as well as the French Revolution, we we covered so much in this episode. I I think it, uh, there's a lot of things people don't know, and uh, it would be good if they knew. So uh, check out my guests, and uh, God bless. Right. God, bless God bless you. you. Bye. Bye bye. Au revoir.